hello, everybody. Thank you um, very much for returning. We're not going to keep you here for too long. Um, so uh, we just thought it, was, it would be worth having a short um, panel discussion and then um, some time for, for questions from any of you. Um, just uh, following that uh, exuberant um, screening of, of Quinny's, to which, for which um, many congratulations again to Mark, George, and, uh, and all the, um, the cast and production team. I wonder whether we could, I could just start by asking Marth to, Mark to set, the, set this very briefly in context um, in terms of the play, it being written in 1915, the sort of culture around and context around uh, antique dealing in London at the time. Is that on? Yeah. Yes, it's on. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, um, yeah um, Quinius has written um, as a novel in 1914, actually. Horace Vachel, who's quite a prolific writer, he wrote, I think he writes over 100 plays and novels uh, during his life. He died in his 90s um, in 1955. Um, so it, it's written as a novel and written as a play in 1915. I think that the context of this is, um, I, I guess that at this date, there, there is an awful lot of anxiety, or seems to be an awful lot of anxiety, amongst collectors about um, genuine, particularly genuine antique furniture. And there are a lot of um, books published in the um, early 20th century on how to detect fakes, particularly how to detect fakes in furniture. Um, so I guess, I guess Horace Vachel is kind of keying into that anxiety that's generally in, uh, uh, in the public. But also the, 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 the kind of character of the antique dealer um, is also emerging as a distinctive social identity, social and cultural identity in, in this period as well. So you get the first um, autobiography of an antique dealer in, um, by the early 1920s. Uh, and they're really interesting overlapping um, kind of layers of authenticity uh, and um, fake um, within, within the novel itself, of course, and in the play, but also in, in the way that um, Horace Vachel plays around with this idea, um, he's basing his character Joseph Quinney on a real antique called Thomas Rowan who was trading in Bournemouth and Southampton in around 1900, uh, 19, uh, up until the 1930s. Uh, and they were great friends, Bashel and um, Rowan were great friends. So there is kind of these extra layers of, of authenticity and characterization that, uh, that Bashel is drawing from uh, kind of real practices and real identities. Thank you, Mark. I realise I've completely failed in my duty to introduce the panel, so I apologise for that. <laughs> so we have Mark Westgarth, as, as you know, um, who has led this project. And then um, our other panellists are Martin Levy, um, immediately to my right, um, who is director of Blairman and Sons, and so speaks very much from within um, the antique trade. Uh, George uh, Rodosthenos, um, who has directed um, this play and film uh, and uh, is a professor at, at Leeds. Uh, and then my colleague Christopher Wilk, keeper of the performance uh, furniture, textiles, and fashion department um, here at the VA. So thank you, Mark, for setting that in context. I wonder, Christopher and then Martin, having seen the film for the first time this evening, whether I could just ask you to, for your kind of initial thoughts uh, in response to it. Well, I, I was fascinated by what Mark had to say, and, and I knew that, you know, that there's obviously a, a wider context to this, but what struck me is how quickly, you know, in the 1880s, um, in um, cabinet makers, woodworking m magazines in London, um, the, the trade in new furniture, people who are making new furniture, are very worried about the rise of the antique trade. Um, and there's a kind of panic about it, which they try to turn into a sort of moral panic about um, you know, what people might be buying. And it fascinates me that by 1914, someone is already writing novels about a trade that appears to be um, much more long established. I don't mean that there, are, uh, there, there hadn't been people for a long time selling old furniture, but rather it had achieved it had a level of respectability in a relatively short amount of time. Um, and uh, also interesting what you said about Quinney and his um, relationship with dealers, because I wasn't quite sure as I wat l watched it and listened to it, whether it was a, um, a morality play that 
where simply the author chose the antique trade to be the vessel for the story, or whether the author had a deeper interest in the antique trade. I wonder, wonder what you thought about that. Well, Basha was a great antique collector. Mm. Um, he, he had a, a, I can't remember the name of the country house um, just outside of Bath, but he filled it full of antiques. Well, I, I very much take Christopher's point about uh, this being something of a morality play. Um, and what struck me very much was how strong the family story was in this. Um, but I think the way that the uh, background of a family involved in the antiques trade made a very good vehicle to tell that story. Um, but I agree with what, what both Mark and Christopher have said that the antiques trade was becoming something more widely recognized by, that, by, 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 the, by the time the play was written. Um, there's already, again, as Christopher said, a long history of antiquities brokers, pe pe people trading in, in old things. Um, but antique dealing per se really became something um, more prevalent from the 1880s, 1890s, uh, with the republication of pattern books, um, with firms reproducing antique furniture to meet a demand probably based on a lot of publications. So people who were uh, not able to buy genuine things from the 18th century, and we're very much talking about um, what is traditionally today felt of as being antiques. So old 18th, 17th and 18th century um, objects of, of all sorts. Uh, so I, th I think that the context of this play um, sits in that period when antique dealing was becoming more widespread and before it became not more regulated um, but more established with things like the Antique Dealers Fair which started I think in the late, in the, in the 1930s, somebody here will correct me on that. Uh, the 34, <laughs> thank you. Um, the, the, the creation of the British Antique Dealers Association, which was meant to um, sort out the good from the not so good, or the bad from the very bad, however you, however you like to say it. Um, we did have a client who called the BADA the bad A, but I'll, I'll, leave, <laughs> I'll leave that to one side. Uh, thank you very much. I was, um, uh, I was tickled by the, the odd reference to the South Kensington Museum as well. And, and again, I wonder whether there's, whether, whether Mark, Martin, Christopher in particular, whether, whether you might say something about the, where the, the museum and, and the, the V&A, of course, which is, a, a, which is only founded in the 1850s, so is, is established by the, by the time the play is written. But the relationships with the dealers um, in those early decades and, and at this time, I wonder whether there's something that... Well, I mean, the museum had, going back, r long relationships with dealers of various kinds. What's happening, um, as we weren't looking just at furniture, but furniture was highlighted in this, was that this is the moment when the V&A is more seriously turning to the collection of British furniture. Because in the 19th century, we were focused mainly on continental furniture, and the museum was very much behind uh, the trend among significant private collectors of collecting um, British furniture. And we're, we're by 1915, well, much helped by you know, a period of nationalism before and leading up to the First World War. And imperial competition, of course, where the collecting of British things, not just furniture, is on the up, especially things allegedly connected with national history and associated with um, British monarchs. Yeah, and I think, um, just to amplify that, just, just because Jerome Phillips is sitting right in front of me, um, uh, the, uh, the, the famous uh, uh, Henry Cupboard, you know, the Gothic Cupboard, uh, which, which came into the uh, collection, I think, 1912. 
um, is, is right in that period where there is an interest in British furniture and also some really important dealers such as Phillips of Hitchin. Um, not called that, I think. Jerome's going to correct me. They were F.W. Phillips, I think, in, in 1911. Uh, um, but yes, I think you're absolutely right. There is, there is something to be said about the increasing interest in British uh, material culture um, by, the, by the First World War. Uh, Martin. Well, I think if, if, if I can talk a little bit about the relationship um, between the antiques trade and museums in general, that's evolved and changed, and it's very, very different even today than it was 40 years ago when I started and then 40 years before that. But I think one of the, one of the, the ways in which the trade helped museums was through the formation of private collections. Um, and I'm delighted to continue um, promoting Phillips of Hitchin. But I think that Jerome's firm's father uh, supplied a lot of furniture to Owen Untermeyer um, during the 40s and 50s, um, all of which was bequeathed to the Metropolitan Museum of, of Art eventually, some of which they um, for better or for worse, have deaccessioned, um, for better and for worse. Uh, um, th those are the sort of ways in which the trade really benefited museums rather than anything more direct, certainly in those early days. And, and just, re just reflecting on that, that now, you said that the relationship has, has changed a lot. Um, from, from your perspective as a, as a dealer and, and perhaps Christopher as a, as a curator and, and keeper of a collection how how do you how's, how does that relationship um, has how has that relationship developed in, in recent years I, I think that um, I, I think that the trade is more welcomed uh, for its views and for the help it can give by the museum world than it once was and if I look at just my own lifetime in this, you know, I look back at Peter Thornton when he chaired, the, when he was chairman of, or whatever the title, head of the um, furniture department here, the people who worked under him at that stage, Simon Jervis is here, Clive Wainwright and John Hardy and so on and so forth. Everybody shared information in a way that um, benefited both sides. And it, it, was, it, was, it wasn't all take on one side you know, it, it was a sort of mutual um, moment of learning. And I, I think that probably wasn't the case if I look back um, to what I understand of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. It was different. There were good relationships with all sorts of people in the trade. Um, but it became and has become more open. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that from on the museum side, um, and you talked about when that began, there was a sort of appreciation of the deep knowledge that lay with um, colleagues in the trade and a, um, a sort of a gradual dissipation of some of the snobbery um, that lay between um, people who um, chose careers in museums or had careers chosen for them um, and vice versa, both in terms of choosing and had chosen for them in the trade. Uh, and I think, you know, people um, who were chosen to be in the trade, who might have chosen to do other things, you know, I mean, that's absolutely the case. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass to George, if that's all right. So George, you, you've come to this from, uh, a directing um, perspective, and I, I wonder whether what, what your thoughts were on being confronted by this um, by this play, and also um, just about how what you think about the kind of process of using a, a play or a film to explore some of these issues um, that, that the, the film has prompted around authenticity, value, uh, the morals within it. 
Um, it was completely and utterly fascinating when Mark approached me in 2015 and said, George, I found this uh, completely unknown play that was extremely famous in 1915 based on the 1914 novel. And um, the novel wasn't on its own. There were uh, Queenie's Adventures, so a series of novels that uh, dealt with Queenie's and um, <laughs> his adventures. So when I read the play first, it was uh, I was a bit overwhelmed with the detail and the amount of knowledge that was required uh, about antiques. And Mark was with us in every single rehearsal, really going through every single item, working with us about understanding as a former antique uh, dealer himself, understanding uh, the approach to the object. So for us, the objects uh, became they had their own performance activity in the piece so the object performed with us um, and when we actually went to filming and the real objects arrived then there was a kind of all the stakes were raised there was a different relationship to those objects not only because we were a bit horrified of damaging them but also because of the prestige of those objects the history and that history that they carried really, I think, changed the performances. And we've got with us today uh, Queenie himself, uh, Sami there. We've got the daughter, Posey, Annabelle at the back. And we've got Sam Tomlin, uh, the other side of the antique dealer, as well as our cinematographer, uh, Patrick Bannon, and Sammy Willits, who was responsible for our lighting and the production uh, management of all the project. And I think they would agree with me that when the objects came in, something changed. But this... Um, play which was there were two BBC films one silent and one um, uh, speaky what we've got there is that it has not been done so I came to the um, to the British Library and listened to a radio version of it and slowly the, 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 the piece with the help of the wonderful performers unfolded itself and I found depths emotional depths in it which goes beyond as you said it's a morality play it's a family play uh, it's a play about arranged marriages. Uh, it's a love triangle in there. And what I loved is discovering with the actors the beauty of the language, the beauty of the narrative. And I think what also was a, a very important point for me is when Mark suggested that we all read the novel. And the novel has a kind of additional um, wealth in it uh, it explained a lot of the gaps that the play cannot really um, cover. But also, um, I'm not going to lie, the novel has a different ending, a completely different ending, and I'm not going to say much more about that. So, we do have an alternative <laughs> ending uh, uh, for you which we will release uh, in six months. And it's a completely different approach, and it was fascinating. Uh, the, the reviews at the time found it a bit saccharine, and they felt that it was a bit of a very sweet ending, but the novel ending is much different. So um, all of these things introduced me to the wealth of this world, but also I think the real objects allowed us to be fully immersed in this world. That's tantalizing about the alternative ending. <laughs> Thank you very much. And George and, and Mark, just, um, uh, and I think this will be our, our last question be before we, we open it up, um, just for a few minutes. Um, it, for, for the benefit of those who, who haven't had a chance to watch the, the short films that you made um, uh, and circulated in advance, I wonder whether you could just say something more about the sets, both the, the objects that you used within this production, but also how the productions were made in, in 1915 and where, where the objects came from. Yeah, well, um, in, in 1915, um, the objects were loaned by um, antique dealers, um, Walter and Ernest Thornton Smith, who were actually interestingly located in Soho Square, which is the fictional location of Joseph Quinley's shop. Um, and also Moss Harris in the 1920s. I mean, various leading antiques of the day loaned, loaned objects. We were very fortunate that we got uh, objects loaned by local antiques, David Love of Harrogate and uh, um, uh, Tony Lum from Charles Lum and Simon Myers from R.M. Myers and Sons. There's the plug for them. I told them they get a plug. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we were very fortunate to get um, genuine antiques. 
some of the things we wanted, we couldn't get. We wanted a Chinese, it was supposed to be a Chinese lacquer um, cabinet, uh, cabinet on stand at the back, which Quinny was coveting and would not sell under any circumstances, but he does. Um, we, we had a substitute for that because it was just completely impossible to, to get a, a Chinese lacquer cabinet. Um, and one of, the, one of the chairs, the Woolsey chair, um, uh, which we managed to get, it's a 19th century copy of, a, of, of an ebony Woolsey chair. Um, that was um, a, supposed to be a Charles II chair. Um, so all of these kind of substitutes required us to amend the script ever so slightly. So, you know, the true black blood, which is a you know, quotation from Horace Walpole about the Woolsey chair, that was dropped into the script to reflect the, the Woolsey chairs. But I, th I think George is absolutely right. That there, was, there was a real energy around using these real antiques. And, you know, and I remember um, um, uh, uh, Fergus is not here, who's, um, uh, who played uh, Jim, carrying that Worcester jug in. I told him, it's about a thousand pounds, that jug, you know, and he went, oh my God. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, just that, the, I mean, but there's a the kind of real energy there as well, that, um, how the actors use the, the set. And if you had uh, I think um, what was really, I think, uh, enlightening for us is that um, the set, and with the help of Mark, discovering the, the value of having uh, those objects with us, I think allowed us to have a different relationship with them. And um, there are many exercises that actors do to relate to a prop, uh, to a specific object, and I think we didn't have to do any of that. The history immediately brought in that um, energy. Um, and what was fascinating is that we think that this play, which was extremely successful, 1915, it went to, um, it was on the West End, it went on Broadway, South Africa, Leeds, it toured Leeds twice. Um, at the time, what we tried to do is, um, there were some original images from that production, and we tried to uh, reproduce them in the play. So if somebody finds those images, they're gonna see the homage that we did in specific. That's why the mother, for example, spends a lot of the time sat down. So that's taken from the original images. And also, I just like to remind everybody that when we filmed this was in July, and there was um, obviously the regulation that the actors could not come close to each other. So at any given point, they've got a meter difference from each other. That's why the, the moments of affection and those moments, nobody, there's no, <laughs> Uh, intimacy allowed uh, and definitely that distance. And of course it affects the relationships and we had, round, we had to work around that. Um, there was a lot of kissing between the young lovers that obviously had to uh, disappear from our version. And the butterfly kiss that in the rehearsals in 2020 was beautifully performed <laughs> had to remain as a reference <laughs> for this final version the constraints of COVID productions. <laughs> and Mark, you were, you were saying that the, um, I mean, one of the things that's also very noticeable is the, ju the juxtaposition between the two sets, the difference between the sanctuary and then, um, and then the, the shady dealer environment. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that the, the because as a, the, the sanctuary is full of, you know, top class, wonderful objects, which Quinny has assembled, of course. Um, and that's, I think my, my suggestion, which I've mentioned in the, the, the second little film that I've done about it, my suggestion is that what Vashel is doing there in having this kind of binary between Sam Tomlin, who's um, interesting down the Fulham Road, I'm not making any allusions to what happens in the Fulham Road, but he's down the Fulham Road, um, uh, and, um, and Quinny, who's you know um, right at the top of the trade. Um, Quinny's set is loaned by antique dealers at the time in 1915, and Sam Tomlin's set is loaned by Lyons Tea Room um, in 1915. It gives you a sense of the, 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 the hierarchy of the kinds of objects that are on the set. And also, I think, by implication, the character of, mm. of, uh, of, the, of the dealers. Absolutely, I think that comes through very strongly. I, I'm just wondering, uh, in old still photographs, can you see actually what was used? Yes. Um, and did what you, choose, you chose reflect that? Yes, it did, Martin, because the 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 um, uh, the, uh, the the Chinese cabinet, which we like to get, we we got a painted cabinet. It was late eighteenth century one, but we did get a painted cabinet. Um, the, the the screen, which is a Dutch eighteenth century Dutch painting, that was supposed to be a Chinese screen, but we couldn't get a screen. But you can you can see, in fact, the set. The, you know, I designed I've designed the, the set in that sense that I just went 
to a photograph and sketched and sent, sent this to George, a little pencil sketch saying, this is what the set should look like. And it actually does reflect the set as it, in the photographs from, from 1915. And I, I mean, I think it's quite an interesting reflection on what a dealer at that medium level of the trade yeah. probably dealt with and considered to be exceptional at the time. Yeah. And I think it's fair to say that that assessment would be very different today. So, I mean, I think you captured that moment very well. If yes, I there'd be so. a few Messerschmitt chairs today, I think, in the set, wouldn't there? <laughs> or rather one Messerschmitt chair. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open it up to, to any questions um, or, or comments from, from the audience. We have uh, two helpers here who are going to take two of our microphones, and then we will share them. Get the, there's, a, there's a kind of almost paranoid obsession for credibility that everybody is searching for there, but you also get the impression that it's quite a small world and it would be unheard of for them to deal with someone that they didn't know. Do you think that the, the sort of insular nature of that community helps or hinders the search for credibility? I, I think if you're talking about that period as opposed to today, I, yes. or are you talking about the, the trade in general? I'm interested in, in the whole lot, so whatever you'd like to. Uh, the, there, is a, there is an enormous amount of interdependence, um, intertrading, friendship, rivalry, um, the, the, but that permeates life. I mean, it, it, it's not just in this field. Um, but I think it's, it's, it, it, it characterizes a lot of it. Um, does it help or hinder? I, I think what helped was that if you again go back to this early period, which was before I was born, um, there was a sort of network of trade around the country and indeed abroad that helped things filter through um, to the dealers who were then if you like, at the top of the pile, um, who were the ones who took the risk, who took the trouble to cultivate serious collectors, um, and then th those collections that were formed. I mean, t take Moss Harris and the Levy Hume collection as an example slightly earlier, but I mean, a major collection formed through a relationship with a particular dealing firm. I, I mean, largely through a particular dealing firm. And then that gets left to become if you like, a museum collection, or at least a collection left for public benefit afterwards. I, I think I'm rambling slightly off your particular question, but I'm trying to explain the benefits, or a benefit, of the way the trade can sometimes work. Thanks, oh, come on. Thanks everyone so much. Um, I'm really interested in the kind of performativity that's going on here, and particularly, when we think about dealers at this time and the performance of the art market and also performing connoisseurship. And I just wondered if that factored into your discussions at all. It was particularly towards the end with the magnifying glass and the chair and kind of this idea of, of, of demonstrating knowledge in this kind of theatrical sense and doing these things that we constantly do to show that. And just if there was any kind of interesting discussions about how that came about through performing the actual play itself. If that, sorry, if that actually makes sense as a question, I'm not too sure, but um, thank you so much. Yeah, um, yeah um, thanks Caroline. I think the, um, the, the, the notion of expertise obviously does play a, um, a significant role in the creation of the film, both, both in terms of the expertise of George, um, in terms of um, um, expert in uh, directing. Um, interesting. I'm, you know, uh, I'm. I, I was so blown away by working creatively. You know, as you know, Karen, I'm a dry as dust historian, but I was so blown away by working with George creatively on this. But I'm actually making a creative piece on performativity in the art market. A very short piece. We're talking to George about it today, which is about that repetition of looking. Um, and the repetition of, of moving objects, and opening drawers, shutting drawers, and what dealers are doing when they're looking at drawers and whatever. So that notion of expertise, 
I think is absolutely crucial. The notion of connoisseurship, connoisseurship is absolutely crucial in, in the construct. And performance, and the, well, the performativity of that you know, opening drawers and shutting drawers and you know, people are scratching their head. What are you looking for when you open a drawer? And it, well, there are very particular things that one, as Martin will, um, will know, of course. Um, so yeah, I think, I think those, th those kind of um, elements of, of connoisseurship and elements of expertise are, are you know, they're littered throughout the, uh, the performance in the play, I think, and the perform performance in the film as well. I don't know. Um, I felt really comfortable in the rehearsals, having an expert in the room. So, of course, Mark did a workshop for all of us, how to view and examine these objects and evaluate uh, authenticity. And I think the actors benefited very much from having an art historian and also a former antique dealer in the room, which uh, who was able to answer all of the questions about, is this how it's done? Um, and it's great, I think, when we bring in the rehearsal room that uh, expert advice and guidance so that we are able to know exactly how that performance of examination takes place. Um, those of us who are interested in the history of the trade kind of have a problem, don't we, in we thinking back beyond uh, earlier than the roadshow and going for a song. Um, this is not a world when antiques were you know, hugely popular and everybody kind of knows and collects um, uh, so, so, something, something about them. And yet, this is a play and a novel which had terrific impact at the time. I don't know how many antique shops were named Quinney's uh, after it. Um, my own father's first house was named Quinney's but, but by his father-in-law. Um, how do you account for that? that influence, Mark. I'm kind of intrigued at this impact and, and why it is so pervasive. You mean the, the particularity about Quinney's itself, the name, or, or what you, I know there, there are actually 22 antique shops called, well, we traced 22 antique shops called Quinney's. The first of which was actually um, named very soon after the, uh, the play in the of 1916. Um, a dealer called William Maskell opened a shop called Quinney's in Hartford. Um, and then from that, you get lots of... I think there is one Quinney's left, um, if I'm right, um, which is in Warwick. In Warwick. Quinney's in Warwick. Yeah, um, yeah but um, I, I think in terms of influence, the more generally on... I, I guess there, mu there must have been an impact on um, people wanting to be antique dealers following the, the novel and, and the play. One would expect that to happen. It would just, oh, I think I'll be an antique dealer. That looks like an interesting thing to do. Um, uh, and you know, as as we know, there are you know throughout the history of the trade, there there have been kind of peaks and troughs in the number of dealers that have, have entered the trade, and whether dealers are considered to be amateurs and collectors becoming dealers and whatever and things. Um, but I think it, it, in, I mean, to answer your question more 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 kind of generally, yes, yes, I think the um, uh, the the kind of cultural phenomenon of um, the the identity of the dealer being in novels and plays, and then in the, uh, George has mentioned there was, a, there was a silent film in 1919, there was a, another film in 1927, I think it is, both of which are lost, um, uh, of Quinney's. Um, so I, and, and there are a number of novels that emerge, you know, from the 1920s, autobiographies of dealers from the 20s, novels of dealers, and then dealers beginning to write about what they call the tricks of the trade as well from the 1920s, revealing all sorts of things about how to be a dealer and whatever. So I think inevitably that, that the kind of cultural phenomenon of the dealer being a cultural phenomenon uh, would, would has a real influence on the way that antique dealing has been kind of thought about and conceptualized and practiced as well. Just, um, okay, the, the thing I'm just going to point f uh, put to you is, is three W's. Um, the the chair was uh, Horace Walpole chair, not a uh, Wolseley chair. And the area in in uh, just outside of Bath, I think it's w Wincombe, or w Whitcomb, that area. And the third one of W, there's a great. I mean, this is brilliant. But there's another um, great novel. And it's a, uh, it's a uh, biography. It's about a dealer called Reggie Way, Reginald Way. And if anyone's read that, and I think it would make a great play again because it's, uh, with, especially with the dealers in the room, it, it, we could all touch on what he experienced. And um, yeah, there was a lot of 
it was very near the bone on that story. So it's very, very good. Yeah, thank thank you. you, Lennox. I think, well, um, Way's book, I think, is a different cultural moment. It's 1956, I think, the um, Reg Way's novel. But there, there is a really interesting um, other note. I don't know if you've um, uh, um, seen the film, uh, what's it called? Uh, Peter Finch is in it. Um, it's written by Daniel Mankiewicz, um, Make Me an Offer. Um, which is also written in the early 1950s and made as a film in, 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 in the late 1950s. And again, that, that characterizes the dealer as a, a very difficult character, somebody who's, who's striving for money and you know, trying to get this, this, a green copy of a Portland vase. I've never seen a green, I don't even, is it, Caroline, is a green, yeah, green Portland vase? I don't know, <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah, but I think, I think you're right. The, um, again, going back to, um, I think Sam's point, if I'm, yeah, um, is that uh, you know, the, the 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 significance of the dealer in in um, cultural literature and and um, in the public consciousness, I think, is 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 something that you know I think we need to pay more attention to. Really, I guess. I'm I'm just going to draw this to a close, only because otherwise nobody will get the chance for a drink. So <laughs> I'm sure that there will be the opportunity for further discussion and questions um, over a, a glass of something in the, in the Silver Gallery. Um, thank you all very much for uh, for joining us. Thank you for your your questions. Thank you to our panelists, Christopher, George, Mark, and Martin. And congratulations to, to everybody who's been involved um, in the film. It's a, a real uh, joy and fascinating um, to see the play performed. So thank you. <laughs>